Welcome to Unit 6, and this one is all about urban areas, or if you're feeling a little stanky, city. Now let's start by reaching all the way back into the dusty cobwebs of history in order to consider the very first cities and how they grew into the vast urban areas that we know today. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked sight and situation style, let's get to it. Okay, now by far the most important concept to understand when it comes to why cities are where they are is sight and situation. Now sight refers to the physical geographical location on which a city is built. Or if you want to get saucy and reach all the way back to Unit Unit 1, site refers to the absolute location of a city on the Earth's surface. So site includes the latitude and longitude of a place and also the features of the physical landscape, like rivers or mountains or forests or whatever. So what site features make a location a good spot for a city? Well, to answer that, let's go back to the establishment of the world's first settlements, which later developed into full-blown cities. Now, hopefully you'll remember from the last unit that these areas that you see here are the various places around the world which were the first to develop agriculture. And because this development caused populations to settle instead of moving all around, the dang place, populations began to grow, and these very same sites are the ones where we find the first cities. And what was it about these places that made them particularly good for dense human settlements? Well, it was their site factors. Things like fertile soil to grow crops, abundant water, buildable land, habitable climate, etc. And look, it's not just ancient cities that develop because of favorable site factors. For example, San Francisco was established as an American city in the 19th century precisely because metric buttloads of gold was found under its surface. But even before that, San Francisco was established as a strategic settlement by the Imperial Spanish because of its tasty site and situation, which is to say, a great natural sea harbor. Oh, and by the way, if you need help getting an A in your class and a five on your exam in May, you might want to check out my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide. It's the fastest way to study, and you can find that link in the description below. Okay, so that's site, but the other crucial factor to understanding the spatial distribution of cities is situation. Now, this describes the way an urban area is connected to other urban areas. Or if you're still feeling saucy, then you can reach all the way back to Unit 1 and remember that this is what we refer to as relative location. And a significant determining factor for the growth and longevity of any city is its relative location to other cities, especially through trade. So as a general rule throughout history, it has been the cities located along high traffic trade routes that have developed the most quickly. For example, Hangzhou, China grew rapidly both in population and wealth precisely because it was situated at one end of China's Grand Canal, which was a major trading artery in that region. And Hangzhou continues to be an economic powerhouse within China to this very day. Or yet another example of situation influencing urban growth would be Samar Samarkand in Uzbekistan. Just like Hangzhou, Samarkand also grew powerful and wealthy because it was located at a strategic point on a major land-based trade route, namely the Silk Road. And even today, the effects of globalization mean that cities with well-functioning ports grow most rapidly because they can facilitate long-distance trade across oceans. And it's going to be helpful for you to remember this little juicy tidbit. A city's situation often determines its function. What I mean is Hangzhou and Samarkand function primarily as trading cities because that was their main situational feature. And the same is true of modern cities as well. For example, Shanghai in China has experienced massive growth and increasing influence since the mid-19th century as a busy maritime trading port. Okay, so we've got site and we've got situation unlocked, and now you need to know why cities are where they are. But now let's shift and figure out what other factors contribute to the growth of cities. And because I love you, I'm going to attach a vocabulary word to that, namely urbanization, which simply refers to all the various factors that cause cities to grow and develop. And look, while urbanization has been going on for roughly... 10,000 years. The process has accelerated globally since the middle of the 18th century and has had profound consequences for human life and flourishing. And there are, in fact, five major factors that influence urbanization, and let me tell you what they are. First is changes in transportation technology. You see, the very first cities on our fair earth had a relatively small footprint since mostly they were made for walking. But over time, the geographic footprint of urban areas grew larger because new ways of moving around them developed. Now, one major development in the growth of cities was the streetcar. Now, this sweet little bippy could carry a lot of people pretty efficiently efficiently, and since a person could go a lot further in a streetcar than on their footsies, cities began to expand. And more to the point, the streetcar and its later relative, the automobile, encouraged the development of the suburbs. Now, by definition, a suburb refers to a residential settlement on the outskirts of an urban area. In fact, the definition is in the word itself, sub-below-urban city. And so, with the advent of streetcars and later automobiles, people were able to live farther away from the city center where most of the jobs were located. Thus, innovation and transportation caused the growth of cities. Okay, now, the second factor that influences urbanization is changes in communication technology. You see, because cities are nodal entities that thrive on connection, new communication technologies have a significant influence on their growth. So with the rise of the telegraph and then the telephone, urban businesses became more efficient because of the increased speed of communication, which led to a rise in productivity, which required more workers in urban areas. And now with the rise of the internet, urban businesses can communicate instantly with their customers all over the world. If you'll reach back into the shadowy regions of your brain, you'll remember this concept from Unit 1, namely space 
space time compression. And then the third factor that influences urbanization is population growth and migration. So as rural populations grow, people often lack opportunities to find work, and that leads to significant rural to urban migration, drawing more people to the cities to find jobs. Now this kind of migration happened like crazy during the Industrial Revolution, but that was mainly confined to those states that industrialized first, like Great Britain and Germany and the United States. But today, this phenomenon is most prevalent in periphery and semi-periphery countries like China and India. Okay, now the fourth factor influencing urbanization is economic development, and for that, let's revisit the Industrial Revolution. Now, as the economies of major cities organized themselves around industrial production, rural to urban migration exploded like a tick in a blood bank. And with all those new people flooding into the cities that changed the primary function of many cities from the center of religious, administrative, or political tasks to primarily economic tasks. And related to that, when all those folks come streaming into the cities to work and live, all that infrastructure that I've been flapping my mouth hole about would need to be provided as well. And finally, the fifth factor influencing urbanization is government policy. Yes, big daddy government always plays a major role in the growth or decline of cities. For example, city governments pass zoning restrictions which determine how land can be used. In other words, it's the government which decides whether a particular piece of land can be used for residential, commercial, or manufacturing purposes. And depending on exactly how the government allots zoning laws, that can have a big consequence for how fast or slow a city grows. Additionally, governments that decide to spend money on infrastructure in order to support their economic function will often see significant urban growth, and those that don't spend that boom boom often see very little growth. Okay, click here to keep reviewing for Unit 6, and click here to grab my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which has everything you need to get an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May. And hey, I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.